Again, we certainly want to express our appreciation for the presence of all of you that are here today and for the privilege that we enjoy of being able to come together as God's people to worship him in spirit and in truth. It is indeed a blessed privilege. We should always be grateful for it. And for those that are visiting with us, we are thrilled that you are with us here today. And we pray that as we enter into the study of God's word, that you'll be benefited and blessed and that all of us can say it has been good for us to have been here. Before I get into the lesson, I want to say to June that I think Brownie is a very good name. <laughs> I've known for years an elder's wife whose name is Brownie, and she was a wonderful woman, and I thought uh, that would be a very good name. We're going to be talking today with regard to, regard to the Lord's Church. The passage read in our hearing just a moment ago is a prophecy with regard to the coming of the Lord's Church to be established in the tops of the mountains, exalted above the hills. It was in the city of Jerusalem, and it was in the last days that this church was to be established. And you remember when Peter in Acts chapter 2 said, This is that which was spoken speaking of the prophet Isaiah and of other prophecies along the way. This was to happen in the last days. The Lord's church was to be established, was established, and we are blessed by this glorious institution that Jesus died for. But I would say to you today that we're in a day and age when many people denigrate the church. They say it's not important. It was an afterthought has nothing to do with salvation. And that's not what the Bible teaches. We need to ask ourselves, what about church membership? As we think about the church, we could, I had intended to read this passage, but you're very familiar with it, where Peter on that day of Pentecost preached that great gospel sermon, came to the end of it, and they said unto him, Men and brethren, what must we do? They had been cut to the heart by the preaching of Peter, who had said that they had with wicked hands crucified the Lord of glory. And Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of sins. And then it says that they that gladly received the word were baptized, and the Lord added to them that day about 3,000 souls. It speaks of the growth and development of the church. And as you come to verse 47, it says, Praising God and having favor with all the church. And the Lord added to the church day by day such as should be saved. The church was growing. It was going forth as the Lord had said that it would. But we need to ask ourselves the question. That's what the question a lot of people ask as they think about the church. Does it matter? Is it really something that is important? Do we need to be a member of the church and do we need to be faithful as a part of the body of Christ? We will look at the church from a number of standpoints. First of all, as we ask ourselves, what is the church? Not what do men say with regard to the church, but what does the Bible say with regard to it? What did Jesus promise? Jesus promised the church in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, looking back toward the beginning of this in verse 13, it said when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the, his disciples, whom do men say that I the Son of Man am? He wasn't asking for information. He knew, but he wanted his disciples to focus upon this. And they said, some say, that thou art John the Baptist. John the Baptist was dead at that time. And those who would say that would be saying that John was raised from the dead, come back, or that he was Elias or Jeremiah, so one of the prophets, all of them were dead. But Jesus said to his disciples, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto you, you are, that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He is not building it upon Peter. If you know the word behind Peter, Peter is Petra. Petras is the great word behind the foundation rock 
upon which the church would be built. It was to be built upon the fact that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. Peter had said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. This is what Peter had confessed. It was uh, what caused Jesus to say, Peter, you're blessed because of this. And upon that rock, he would build the church and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. We need to understand the importance of this glorious institution. Down in Mark chapter 9 and verse 1, Jesus said, For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. But we need to understand that it's built upon that. Christ made the statement that during his, the lifetime of some that stood there, that the kingdom of God would come with power. Not only that, as we think with regard to the foundation in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 11, there's a passage that says, Other foundation can no man lay. Mark 9, 1 was the one that said that during the lifetime of some that's, that stand here, the kingdom of God will come with power. But it was to be built upon the foundation uh, that what lay which is Jesus Christ. It was not upon a flimsy foundation of any individual. Even Peter, as good as Peter was, he was not the foundation upon which the church would be built. But notice with me also that it is not a physical building. The church is not made of mortar and brick and stone. The church is made of individuals. The statement in 1 Peter 2, 5 through 6 we find him saying, you also are lively stones, are builded up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable unto God. Wherefore also let us, wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, behold I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect and precious, and he that believeth on him shall not shall not be confounded. That cornerstone was Jesus Christ. The church was built upon him. He was the cornerstone, and those who are members of it are lively stones. We're to offer spiritual sacrifices. We are a holy priesthood, and we have that kind of response, and that's why we're here today, to be able to be that kind of people doing those kinds of things. In Isaiah 28 and verse 16, it says, Therefore thus saith the Lord, Behold, I lay in Zion a foundation for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. And then again in Ephesians 2 and verse 19 through 21, it says, Therefore you are no more strangers or foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon a foundation of apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all, all the building fitly compacted or framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord. So what is the church? It is composed of individuals, these individuals who have been baptized into Christ a part of this glorious institution. Jesus is the head, and we are to be lively stones. We are to be a part of that glorious institution that Jesus promised to build and was fulfilled in Acts the second chapter as it came into being in reality. But also, as we ask of what is the church, we look uh, to a passage in uh, Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, where it says when this is the day of Pentecost, what happened on that day? When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and sat upon each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. A great cloud came together on that occasion, and we find them, as he came to the end of that sermon, and we just alluded to it a moment ago, saying, What must we do? They were cut to the heart. And then here in verse 47, after thousands of them had obeyed the gospel, it says they were praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added unto them that day about 3,000 souls. And verse 47 says he was adding day by day such as should be saved. 
That's the passage in Acts 2, 47 here. Praising God and having favor with all the people. The Lord added. People don't join the church. Every once in a while you'll say, I'm thinking about joining the church. The Lord adds people to the church who have been saved. What is the church? It is a group of people that have been saved from their past sins, are part of the body of Christ in that kind of spiritual relationship in this glorious body. And as we think also, we need to recognize that there are various other illustrations of what it's all about. The Bible teaches that Christ purchased the church. He bought the church. Acts 20 and verse 28 says that we're to take heed to ourselves. This is particularly talking to the elders at Ephesus. As Paul says, take heed therefore to yourselves and to the flock over the which the Holy Spirit hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. So Christ promised the church. He built, it was built upon his foundation, not a physical building. It was a promise that was fulfilled, and Christ bought it. He purchased it with his own blood. In 1 Peter 1 and verse 18 and 19, he says, You know that you were not redeemed, with corruptible things such as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by the tradition from your fathers. But what were they redeemed with? But with the precious blood of Christ, as a lamb without blemish and without sacrifice, without spot. As we assemble around the Lord's table to remember his suffering and partake of the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine, we're remembering the body and blood of our Lord and the sacrifice that he made on our behalf. What is the church? Those are the things the Bible teaches with regard to it and more than that really. But as we move on, uh, we need to understand that there's a relationship that is spoken of in Ephesians 5 and verse 23 that Christ will save the church. It is the saved, this passage says, for as the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Let me tell you today that Christ does not promise to save any other body, any other institution, any other organization than that which he has built. He is the savior of the body which is the church. He is the head of the church. We need to honor the head. We need to serve him faithfully. And ultimately, those who have been saved will hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. So, does it matter? Is it important? Absolutely, it matters, and it is important. But what is the purpose of the church? We're going to think with regard to this as we look at a number of passages. First of all, we've already said it contains the saved. Acts 2 and verse 41 says, then they that gladly received the word were baptized, and the same day they were added to them about 3,000 souls. Verse 47, praising God, having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. These two verses make it very plain that the church is composed of the saved. Christ doesn't make any mistakes. He doesn't add to the church anyone that is not saved. On the other hand, those who have been added are people that have obeyed the gospel, have been saved from their past sins, and need to live faithful in the service of the Lord to hear him say, well done. The purpose of the church, it contains the saved. It has a purpose and a work to do, and that involves the preaching of the gospel of Christ. In the giving of the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28, he said, go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. The Lord's Church is a teaching institution. Were it to quit teaching, it would go out of existence in one generation. We are to be people that have been taught and are teaching others it is our responsibility to do that. In Acts 8 and verse 4 it says, Therefore they were scattered abroad. This is when the great persecution came upon the church. In the first part of the 8th chapter, great persecution came upon the church. 
and they were scattered abroad, but they did not go silently. They went forth, they went everywhere preaching the word. Jesus had said that the church would go from, the gospel would go and spread from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth, and that is exactly what was happening. The purpose of the church not only contain to say and to preach the gospel, but it is to uphold and support the truth. To young Timothy, Paul writes to him in 1 Timothy 3 and says, If I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Notice that means support, that which upholds. It's not P-I-L-L-O-W. If you're sleepy this morning, wake up. It's not that the church is to be a place where we sleep, but it is not to be, while not a dormitory, it is to be uh, that which would carry forth the gospel of Christ and to be the ground that would support, the pillar that would support and the ground of the truth. Our responsibility is to spread it to the whole world. To make known the wisdom of God according to Ephesians chapter 3. And here we find Paul writing and saying, To me who am less than the least of the saints, this grace is given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hid in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. It wasn't something that was mysterious and weird, but it was something that had been hidden, something that had been concealed, con conceived in the mind of God at the very beginning. And by prophecies across the years, a little bit here and a little bit there, but finally made known through the manifold wisdom of God, made known through the church to principalities and powers, and it is the responsibility of the church to continue to make known that which the Lord uh, has given to us, that we spread the gospel of Christ. And we are also, as we talk about the church, have the responsibility to offer spiritual, offer spiritual sacrifices. In 1 Peter 2 and verse 5, he says, Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to do what? to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, they were commanded to offer animal sacrifices, the blood of bulls and goats and things of that nature. But we come together today to offer up praise and worship to God, the singing of praises, the offering of our prayers, and the assembling around the Lord's table, and engaging in the acts of worship. And all of these things are a part of the spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable unto God. We're to worship Him in spirit and in truth. It is also true, as we think about that, that one of our major purposes is to glorify God. While we're to love one another, and we're to extend fellowship one with another. We do not come together just for the purpose of being with one another. It is to glorify God. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 21. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. We need to give glory to God always in everything as we offer thanks for our meals, as we live from day to day. But especially this day is the Lord's day and we need to recognize that the Lord's day belongs to him and we need to give glory to him on that wonderful day. But as we talk about the church, now let's talk about how is it governed. When you look at churches around the world, there are many kinds of organizations. There are those that have a pyramid with one individual at the top and various, various groups along the way and uh, it is a pyramid structure. There are various kinds of organizations, but as you look at the Lord's Church, we find that each congregation is independent. Christ is the head of all, and all of these that are in the body of Christ 
are members thereof. Ephesians chapter 1 says, And hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. And then the statement in the 18th verse of Colossians, he says, He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. There is no head on, on earth. There is no man that can serve as the head of the church. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. And we're members individually in that, in that glorious body. Christ not only is the head of the church, he is called the chief shepherd. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses, or rather 5, he says, when the chief shepherd, that's verse 4, we'll look at verse 1 in just a moment, but he says, when the chief shepherd shall appear, then shall you also appear, then shall you receive the crown of life that fadeth not away. Elders in the church are shepherds, they're not the chief shepherd, they are under shepherds, under the shepherding work of Jesus Christ and serve as shepherds. But then also it's governed by his word. We are to study the word, read the book of God, lay it up in our hearts. Ultimately, we'll be judged by it. In Matthew 28, it says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. The teaching work of the church, if first of all, is to baptize those who have been taught and then to continue to teach them all things whatsoever the Lord has commanded. In, Matthew, in John 12, we find it saying, he that rejecteth me, and receiveth not my word, hath one that judgeth him. The word which I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. The Bible is a marvelous book. It is a good book, a wonderful book, but not just a book of good sayings. It is the words of our Lord that tell us what we will be judged by, and we need to know, understand it, read it, and lay it up in our hearts to be pleasing in his sight. Elders are to feed the body of Christ. Remember it says that Christ is, the, Christ is the chief shepherd. But this passage also begins, verse 1 and 2, he says to uh, the elders which are among you, I exhort, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not of constraint, but willingly. Elders in the Lord's church, have a serious, awesome responsibility. We're grateful for our elders here at South Florida Avenue. Across the years, this congregation has been blessed with a good group of men who serve in that capacity. It is indeed an awesome responsibility. And this passage says, feed the flock of God. They are shepherds and have the responsibility for being sure that the the flock of God is fed as it should and overseen as it should be, not by constraint, but willingly. But then think with me also as we talk about the Lord's church, we need to ask ourselves as we come toward the close of the lesson today, how does one become a member of this glorious institution, the body of Christ, the kingdom of God, the, uh, the glorious called out, group of God's people. How do they become members? First of all, the importance of hearing the word. In John, we find it saying, uh, in verse six, uh, chapter 6 and 45, it says, It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard, and hath learned of the Father, cometh unto me. It is necessary to be taught. One who cannot be taught and understand cannot become a member of the body of Christ. That's the reason that babies are not baptized. They cannot be taught at that point. When they come to the age of accountability, then they are to be taught, then they are to understand and to believe and to come to the point of repentance. In Acts 8 and verse 5, it says that Philip went down to Samaria he went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the people with one accord gave heed to those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. There was great joy in that city. There were many people that obeyed the gospel of Christ. But it was important that they hear the gospel first of all. In Mark 16 it says, 
He said unto them, Go into all the world, and do what? Preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. We are to believe in Christ, hear the word, believe in Christ. In Mark 16, we find it saying uh, that uh, and this is when Paul was on the first missionary journey. And he came into this area and they brought them out and said, Sirs, this was at Philippi, really it's the second missionary journey. At Philippi, he'd been cast in prison and uh, had been beaten and there was a great earthquake and the prison doors were shaken and here the jailer said was about to take his life and Paul said do thyself no harm we are all here and he called for a light and sprang in and said sirs what must I do to be saved and they said believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house it's important to know that this man was a heathen and really didn't know anything about Jesus, didn't know what to believe about him. To continue this passage, we find it says, And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptized. Just as the scripture had said that they were to go and to preach and to baptize, they preached to this man, he believed what he had heard, he believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and he was to be baptized and he did exactly that. And then there's the passage in Acts 4 and verse 12. It says, when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Hearing and believing and being baptized is a part of becoming a member of the Lord's church. But it's also necessary that one repent. We've already talked about Acts 2 and verse 38 that said, uh, Repent, let every one of you repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. With, hear the word, believe in Jesus Christ, repent of sins, and to confess one's faith in Christ. You remember that Philip left that great meeting in Samaria. The Spirit called him away and sent him down on the road that went from Jerusalem to Gaza and he saw a man in a chariot and he ran and joined himself to that chariot. Uh, he asked the individual, uh, understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, how can I except some men guide me? And so we, as we come to the verse 36, it says, and they went on their way, they came to a certain water. Philip had come up in the chariot and was preaching to him and preached to him beginning with the same scripture, Isaiah chapter 53, beginning with the same scripture and preached to him Jesus. And this is what the man said, see here is water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, if thou believest, thou mayest. And he said, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. It's important to believe. It is essential to confess. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness, Paul said in Romans 10, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Hear the word of God, believe in Christ, repent of one's sins, and to be baptized into Christ. Again, Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized every one of you. Paul speaks to the effects in uh, Romans chapter 6 and verse 4, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we shall also walk in newness of life. One dies to sin, rises from the watery grave of baptism, and to goes forth to walk in newness of life. It is a beautiful and wonderful picture. And then finally, Colossians 2 and verse 12. Paul here says, buried with him in baptism, in which ye also are raised with him through faith, in the operation, through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. My friends today, the church is important. It, Im it matters. It is a glorious institution composed of those who have been saved from their past sins. It is an institution governed by elders, by shepherds over the flock of God, and guided by the word of God itself. It is people who have obeyed the gospel of Christ. 
And as we come to the end of this lesson today, if there are those among us today who have never obeyed the word that we've been talking about, the word of God by being baptized into Christ and turning from their sins, confessing their faith in Christ, and rising to walk in newness of life, we urge you today to give serious thought to the condition that you find yourself in. If you're not a Christian today, why not come to obey the gospel of Christ? If you're here today and you know that you simply haven't lived as you should, and you need to confess your sins and ask for forgiveness, the Bible teaches that the Christian who would repent of his sins and ask for forgiveness can be forgiven. First one needs to be in the body of Christ, but in the body of Christ, it's a glorious institution. If you need to come back to make your life right, or if you need to come obeying the gospel of Christ today, in either case, we invite you and encourage you to come as together we stand and as we sing.